lovely to see you all again. Um, now we're going to move on to, we've talked about fusion regulation and where that's potentially heading. Well, what about the technology itself? So today we've got Isabel Machado, an up and coming project engineer at our system. And I'll hand you over to Isabel straight away. Thank you. So, hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm Isabel. And, well, I've been asked to present a little bit the current fusion projects and the challenge, as well as a system and the diversity project. So let's get to it. <laughs> so this, this slide here is just to give a little perspective of my background and to explain how I end up here representing, well, Fusion and our system. Uh, as you can probably have guessed by now by my name and that little flag right on the left corner. Um, I'm Portuguese. I've started my studies in Portugal doing a Bachelor in Mechanical Engineer. And then I've taken the big decision to go towards uh, energy, where I went more specifically to nuclear and I did a double masters in nuclear engineering in Barcelona, Spain, and then the second year in nuclear debt commissioning and waste management in Paris, France. And to finish that master, I had to do an internship and that's where I ended up with a system doing well, helping developing um, concept design for an innovative hot cell for ITER. Um, well, that's where Fusion comes up <laughs> and now three years and a half have passed and I've got the opportunity to work in Fusion projects, uh, in Fission, debt commissioning and most recently I've moved to the UK where I'm a project, working as a project engineer for Fusion projects or the new build, the step of course, the UK favourite and the debt commissioning strategies that we need to think of for Fusion and also on the side developing hydrogen business for the company. So as I only have half an hour and I'm not a technical lead with 20 years of experience, unfortunately, uh, if you do have any technical questions, do not hesitate to contact me after the presentation and I will redirect you to one of our nuclear fusion uh, technical leads. I hope that's okay. <laughs> so, a little bit of our system for those that don't know yet, our system is an engineering service provider and we work in various domains um, such as nuclear, renewables, hydrogen, transportation, defense. This digital transformation has been the new hot topic and we have been identified as the number two company in the world to work on nuclear engineering. So if you are interested in knowing more about our system, just don't hesitate and go to visit our site. It's not the topic of today, so we're going to go into fusion. <laughs> so today's topic, so we go fusion first, major projects, then how our system has been working on fusion and then diversity project within our system. So what is fusion? <laughs> the big question I've heard, it's the fusion day today. Uh, so fusion is the process that powers our sun and all the other stars in the universe. It occurs when the star is first formed from a dense gas cloud where the gravity due to the mass of the gas within the cloud generates enough temperature and pressure for the electrostatic repulsion of atoms to be overcome. However, this is not an easy thing to recreate and for this reason, scientists and engineers all over the world have come together to develop the required technology to recreate this process and achieve a source of sustainable energy and eventually validate the process and the design and the materials to get something that is commercially viable and also economically. So why, if we look at it, it's a lot of problems and why is it such a good thing and why we keep going after it? So. The reaction that we need to occur, that needs to occur to achieve fusion plasma are highly exothermal, with this meaning that each reaction releases more energy than the one that is consumed to get the plasma. And don't forget, that's exactly what we're looking for. So it's getting energy out of something without having to spend much. So if we look at it, I'm sorry, I'm going to go for <laughs> a little swear. So if we look at it as a recipe, I've just moved to the UK, apparently 
Sunday roast is a big thing here. And we need the exact, the exact ingredients, the right conditions to do it. So if I present you a kitchen with no stove, no over, over, you won't be able to do it, but probably you can with a gas thing, camping gas, but it would never be the perfect thing, safe and good. So it's more or less the same situation for fusion where we know the ingredients, but we don't yet have the right conditions to make energy. In this case, we need the combination of hydrogen ga gases, deuterium and tritium. These two are heated at very high temperatures to create a plasma. And then these two atoms fuse and the energy is released, forming a heavier helium and atom and neutron. And there we go, we have the energy, we have the ingredients, but as I mentioned, if we go and look at the kitchen, so the structure that can support this reaction, that's where we have a problem, is that we cannot reproduce the same pressure and temperatures required through gravity. So this is where we and as engineers need to get creative and to find a solution and go around the problem. The most viable solution found at the moment is through the use of magnetical fields, which twist and squeeze the hydrogen atoms into a plasma. However, to achieve a sustainable energy, we need to be able to produce large amounts of plasma and to do so implies operating at 100 million degrees Celsius. And that is, believe it or not, 10 times hotter than the center of the sun, which it's incredible to even think that we could reproduce that on Earth. There are several types of fusion reactors and being studied and for this presentation we'll focus on the magnetic confinement which is the most developed one. So I hope and I've heard you already know ITER so we'll start with the major project that is in construction at the moment which is ITER and is the international one where everyone is well, capable or able to work on. And so the International Thermal Nuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER, will be the largest document ever built and is a joint global effort to crack fusion. Um, the tokamak is a magnetic confinement, as I said before, is the most well-developed and well-funded approach to fusion nuclear. Tokamak is a Russian acronym for toroidal magnetic confinement. Uh, to simplify the donut shape, so that's it. It's the core of the reactor is a donut where the plasma goes around without touching the walls, hopefully. So the method involves generating a plasma using a magnetic field, generating large amounts of heat, which is uh, raced around the torus of the reactor. The reactor is designed to produce 500 megawatts of thermal energy from an input energy of 50 megawatts, which means it's a Q, Q value of 10 that's what we want is that we put 50 we get 500 out we're winning that's that's the thing that's the goal however this machine for the moment will not be connected to a steam generator neither the electrical grid is purely experimental and why is it because it's one of a kind and the goal is yes to produce 500 megawatt of fusion power but to demonstrate and validate the all the operations, all the material, the design, that the design works, that the choices that have been done work and are eff efficient when producing energy. So, and on the other side, on the chemical side, physical part, part of it is to achieve the deuterium and tritium plasma and self-breeding where we create, the, rea the reaction itself creates tritium that can feed the next reaction. That's it. But we go a little bit into detail on ITER because it's the one that we've worked the most and it's the one that's been, uh, well, it's been going on for years now. <laughs> we had uh, a lot of work going on there. So if we go into, well, just some pictures. <laughs> this is ITER on July this year. So this is the construction uh, of the Tokamak. This is the center of the Tokamak. This is where we are. Well, I think it's a bit more or advanced at the moment but this is a good image of how it's progressing and now you have well this is where we're going to go for 
all the plant systems and everything together and working together. So if we go for what's inside ETO, and there's a number of different components that make make up the ETO talking about itself. It's not one system, it's not two systems, it's not even five systems. It goes to a number more than 50 systems that are then multiplied by several hundreds of, of equipment. So, and each is crucial as the next to create uh, and sustain, create and sustain the plasma. We'll look now at the magnets and the vacuum vessel, um, which are some of the big components within the tokamak. So, uh, the magnets, the magnets are <laughs> several superconducting magnets, which are used to produce the magnetic field. As I said before, the plasma is achieved by magnetic confinement. So, mag magnets are the key element of this reactor. There are large D-shaped toroidal field magnets which are placed around the vacuum vessel for confinement of the plasma and then poloidal field magnets are situated outside the toroidal field to contribute to stability. The central solenoid, however, is housed inside the central column of the tokamak and is the most powerful in magnet in the ETA assembly and will initiate, sustain the plasma current. The solenoid is the backbone of ETA magnet system. The key challenge for this one are, of course, the size, the height, weight, weight, the weight is um, approximately 25 ton each to a thousand ton, and which on the other side makes remote handling, maintenance, and everything that we need to do during operation, well, even construction, constructing this super magnet, superconducting magnets has been. Uh, problem but well we made it it's it's getting there but well, now we need to think ahead and it's on the operational part of the reactant how we're going to maintain them um so now vacuum vessel um the vacuum vessel is where the ETA experiments will take place it's a sealed container that houses the fusion reactors and acts as the first safety container barrier as well as providing support to for other in-vessel components, such as the bridge blanket and the diverter. The vessel, it provides a high vacuum environment for the plasma and improves radiation shielding and plasma stability. There's 44 pots in the vessel that allow access for remote handling, operations, diagnostic heat heating and vacuum systems. In-wall shielding is provided also in space between the double walls of the vacuum vessel to protect the components. As you can imagine, this is a huge component and the, the goal is vacuum. So our key challenge is how we maintain vacuum. How can we do operation? How can we use remote handling systems and ensure that the ceilings are uh, still ceiling, still operating and still efficiently maintaining vacuum inside the, the vessel? So these are the two great ones, big ones, and though we're going to go for two more, and then we change projects. <laughs> so we have blankets and cryostat. The blankets are designed to protect and cover the completely the inner walls of the vacuum vessel. Uh, they are in the steel structure and within. They protect also the superconducting toroidal magnets from the heat and high energy neutrons produced. As I said in the previous slides, when you do the reaction, we have helium and neutrons. So all the neutrons that are free, they need to, and they are high energy neutrons. So then we need to make sure that they do not, they do not damage our structure. So the blanket will also be used to breathe tritium and the capability to fear the reaction again for future reactor, for future to maintain the reaction alive. Future reactors will need large amounts of its own soft bread tritium to power the necessary energy and can to be considered self-sustained. So the kinet kinetic energy from the neutrons is transformed into heat energy and this heat is collected by water columns. The heat extracted by the water column will be used in the future fusion plants for energy production is the same process this is where it gets similar to fusion where 
you get water being heated, heated up and then using that to generate electricity. For the moment, ITER not connected to the grid. Let's not forget that. <laughs> it's purely experimental and to prove that what we're doing is the right way to go. So the key challenge for blankets are the remote handling and the repairs that we need to do during maintenance. It's because it's in the center of our tokamak and it's how we access it and how we can replace if we need, if we need to repair, how to get there. So that's it for blankets. If we go for Kroestat, the Kroestat we have, it's the largest stainless steel high vacuum pressure chamber ever built in the world, providing a high vacuum ultra cool environment for the ITER vacuum vessel and the superconducting magnets. There's large elbows situating between, between the Kroestat and the vacuum vessel, which will allow for thermal contraction and expansion of the structure during operations. Uh, for this one, as you can imagine, is again the same thing, is they, they are close contact on terms of maintaining vacuum and maintaining the vacuum vessel working. So it's how can we ensure that the resealing of cutting services is okay and also rejoining the services whenever we need to operate within it. So that's it for <laughs> ITER. And if we go for the big brother of of um, demo so demo is a project um, in the next fusion generation reactor so demo is the bigger eater that can be connected to the grid it's inspired in eater it will take all the feedback that it can from eater design eater construction everything that went wrong in eater it's uh, or and well and that worked on eater will be taken in as input for demo. So the demo has a big roadmap that depends on ITER start of operation, but in any case, the design already started and it's meant to have a conceptual design by 2030 and have an engineering design by 2040 and start construction after that. So the overall targets for the demo reactor are similar to those of ITER, but in this case, the major goal is to actually produce energy that can be injected to the power grid. So that's it for demo. So we keep the same goal as ITER, but more as a connected to the grid re reactor. So if now we go to STEP, which is an English project, STEP means spherical tokamak for energy production and is the UK prototype for commercial nuclear fusion reactors that will be connected to the grid. Um, I've heard people calling the STEP as the SMR of fusion reactors. I'm not sure if everyone will agree, but in fact, it, it can be called that. It's a smaller, it's a smaller nuclear react, nuclear fusion reactor and will be connected to the grid and is intended to check if it is feasible and economically doable for commercial use. So this, this reactor has some different characteristics than the ITER one uh, and the demo also, but because first of all, this shape is not a tokamak. So the core of the reactor is not a tokamak, is, um, is a spherical core, which is more like a cord apple instead of a donut to make it simple. <laughs> so the technical objectives for this is um, same as before. It's always the same. It's produce energy, make sure it's safe, make sure it's um, commercially viable, uh, that we achieve plasma stability, that is self-breeding through Zoom, and of course that we can do remote handle um, maintenance and operations. The roadmap for this project is a bit shorter. So we are hoping for having a complete, <laughs> complete and operating uh, reactor by 2040, which is, as you can have seen from the last slide, uh, demo construction will start in 2040. So it's a must, it's a much faster reactor and goals for this one. So this is step <laughs> we get another English project that I felt that it was necessary to add it even if it is a research reactor 
It's a uh, mast has been operating since well, it operated between two thousand to two thousand thirteen, and it is is now going to be upgraded to help and get some experience return from uh, to, to be used in the step program. Mo mainly the the test of the unique system of minimizing the exhaust hit from the hot gas of fusion fuels. So this is just a, well, just, it's, a, it's, a, it's an experimental reactor that will be used to get results and test things before we can finalize the design for step. And that's it. So now we go for my favorite part. <laughs> As a decommissioning, I, I had to include something about decommissioning and it's because in the nuclear world, I think everyone knows that we start thinking about decommissioning from day zero of a reactor life. You, you won't do safety regulations without getting the decommissioning plan, even if it's just a two pages or just the, the preliminary uh, decommissioning plan. Um, <laughs> the decommissioning plan to to go over the the, the reactor. So um, this is the last phase and probably the most important. Well, because after reactor dies, we need to do something. We need to get it back. We need to get Earth back to its normal situation. So the decommissioning phase is not. It's one of the most challenging ones because first of all, it doesn't make money. So if we don't get money, people tend to forget or tend to not want to do it because you will not produce energy and so will not get us something out of it. But do decommissioning is something that is done after 40 years, 50, 60 years of operation and sometimes even less. But there's people going in, people going out, data that is lost, it's paper, paperwork that's been, I don't know, forgot and misplaced. And so it's really hard to track all the information and where things are. And so it's a major problem to get everything together and have everything according and ready to go for that commissioning. So for this reason and having the good news that digital transformation is coming in, um, strong power and being able to do 3D scans, we do being able to do digital twins, and getting us platforms to uh, train the operators, train the people on the staff that is going to do the remote operated ha operations. So this is now being introduced also in Fusion, where they are already thinking of, oh, how can we do robotic handled operations now that we have the designs? How can we do a digital twin now with all the information that we get from the design? How can we get now a digital twin that can be used later for their commissioning? So, the, the way of, of thinking is starting to change and getting there or the point where, okay, we know that now digital is a, a big thing and, and now we can transfer that and train people to be better at their commissioning at the end and keep that, that information safe for later use. So I've been having, <laughs> sorry, I have a message that I need to stop. <laughs> uh just say a system involvement i would go quickly for a system involvement if you need any more information um i'll just send me a message or an email and i'll get to you get back to you so with our system we work with ita demo and step ita has been our main project where we have engaged in momentum consortium that we do all kinds of um, activities within the site and outside the site so it's engineering services that go from system engineering to construction, manufacturing and everything. We support the client as we can, as much as we can, basically. So if you need more information on that, either visit our site or send me an email and we'll get your information as much as possible. <laughs> so now nah, just the last three slides and we changed completely the topic. Uh, I'll make sure this fast. So people can stop sending me a message to stop talking um so our system has a big project that it's uh diversity so making sure that even though we work in a niche um environment that is nuclear and we get to a point where there is a diversity level which is 
acceptable, <laughs> I'd say. Where they are an equal uh, room for women and men to work on the same kind of things. So, and as a project engineer, I would, I would go for this really rational and logical aspect is why would it, this be interesting for me? Why would it, why would it help me? So one side is because the teams are better if they're mixed. There's more ideas coming in. There's more diversity of ways of thinking. Logical thinking can be logical, but everyone has their own logic of getting to a solution. So engineering is problem solving. And if we have 10 heads that think exactly the same, we're not going to get a solution. We're going to get one solution out of it. If we have, I don't know, five, 10 different heads working with different ideas, different ways of thing, seeing things, then we get amazing. We get loads of solutions that then we can choose and take the good bits of each and get to a perfect solution. So that's one, that's good. Good good result, that's what we want. And so if we get a better, a better solution, then we're more efficient in terms of costs, in terms of quality. And of course we are 50-50 in this world, so we can't only work with one side. It wouldn't be fair and it's not good. <laughs> so now uh, just to, um, the last slide is our three pillars of our system, um, which is for us at the moment, the next the five year roadmap to recruit talent retention and career by recruiting is recruiting by quality and their skills the, the, independently of gender and where they come from. And also some, go and, and teach younger kids, younger girls that engineering is for everyone and not only uh as they they might see it as only men's side or are not really adapted to girls and it is an open subject for everyone talent retention make sure that everyone is happy and motivated to work because if you're not motivated it's not worth it's not worth continuing working on what you do might as well change and then career make sure that everyone has equal career um opportunities and that's it. That's it. And I have a little message coming in. <laughs> that's it for me. Uh, so yeah, don't forget nuclear fusion, nuclear engineering, and then diversity. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, that's Isabel. Awesome. That's uh, <laughs> that's uh, brilliant. Thank you very much. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? How quickly thirty minutes can disappear when you're presenting. <laughs> Did a fantastic job there. Thank you very much. You know, I was privileged enough to visit ITA uh, uh, in July, and I must say it's an amazing site, considering that what within the last decade it was open field with Songlia running around, that's wild boar, and that whole site's been transformed um, by 35 nations effectively getting involved and putting together an amazing project. And let's face it, you know, what, what the pandemic has also shown how nations can come together and put amazing projects together. The piece on uh, Incredible Women is important, the whole EDI thing, we could take lots and lots of time on that. Uh, for, you know, we, we don't want to miss out on the talents of, the, of half the population uh, when we do need them to be involved in all these amazing projects that we've got lined up. Um, we haven't got time for questions, uh, unfortunately. We will pass them on through you electronically, Isabel, and you can respond to those in, at your leisure. Thank you very much.